So we're going to go into the last um, hour of the day, and uh, it might not even be a full hour. We'll 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 see. So you might you might get out of here a little bit early. Um, so we're going to talk about California considerations. My disclaimer is that I have never lived in California. I am a very geographically oriented person. What I mean by that is I actually have my bachelor's degree in geography, and so I. Um, spend a lot of time thinking about how place shapes our lived experiences. So I have lived um, most of my life in the Midwest. I have also lived in the South because I lived in New Orleans for five years. Um, but I have never lived on the West Coast. And so I want to fully acknowledge, this is my disclaimer, that I do not have the California-specific knowledge that um, probably most, if not all of you on this uh, hour have. So um, I think Snowden is also going to um, also share some of um, the California specific resources that we should be aware of. So this is just my disclaimer that when I'm talking about the things that I do know about California, take it with a huge grain of salt because I did spend and have spent the majority of my life in the Midwest. All right. You so, know, we have palm trees and beaches and stuff. Yeah, I so. know. I know. Yeah. I spent I sent, um, two weeks last year in California, mostly like uh, between Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Oakland, and Sacramento. And it was great. It was like, oh, my God, I loved it. I had so much fun. And I was like, I, I mean, I know I'm mostly talking to Southern California people right now, so I don't want to like accidentally like launch a regional division here but I was just like oh like I get why people move to California and they just like love it I just I get it so anyway um I I think SAA is in isn't SAA in Los Angeles or somewhere not this year but next year Oh, I don't. Yeah, SAA is in DC this summer. I know because um, you're on the panel with me, Snowden. I know. <laughs> but I was thinking next year. Someone told me that it was in Southern California next year. I don't know. Someone can fact check that while I'm talking. While I'm you, you can you can check on that while I uh, totally screw up everything about your state. So, um, okay, one of the things that I love doing is um, showing people really interesting climate visualization and climate assessment tools. Again, there's a wealth of them online. Um, so this, um, this first link here, this is really interesting. So the climate mapping for resilience and adaptation assessment, uh, this is fairly new. It was produced with the, I think, advice of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's what you can do is you can put in um, your address in there or, or a specific location. And what it will also give you is a lot of um, like socioeconomic data too. So it will say, you know, this is a, like, this is a community where, um, you know, X number of people are below the poverty line. And, and therefore, you know, like there might be some issues with like, you know, heat extremes and people who don't have um, certain like air conditioning in their house, things like that. So the, the climate mapping for resilience and adaptation assessment. This is a huge new tool that just came out in the last year. Um, it's hosted by ArcGIS, which is a major geospatial data thing. Um, but I definitely recommend this tool. I think it's really useful. I think it's um, a little bit of a game changer in terms of really uniting both like climate concerns and how it actually impacts our communities. So definitely recommend that. Um, there's also something called Cal Adapt, which is a California specific tool that I have only just started playing with this week. Um, so, um, so definitely recommend that. One of the things that's cool about Cal Adapt is you can uh, go into that and pick things by watersheds, which is very cool. Uh, so definitely encourage you guys to check that out. Stella is letting us know that SA 2025 is in Anaheim. Thank you. So I have no idea where it is in 2024. Maybe it's back in Chicago. Um, Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Yeah. It's usually like DC, Chicago. Um, 
usually in the past, it was DC, another city, then Chicago, then another city, then DC. Um, Stephanie C mentions that um, archive course materials from the 80s touch on climate and environmental issues. Yeah, I totally, totally believe that. I think um, one of the things that's really interesting about the 1970s and 80s with environmental history is how closely linked the anti-nuclear movement was with um, the environmental movement. So there are a lot of really close connections um, between the anti-nuke movement and um, environmental stuff. So a lot, and there's a lot of like kind of things with the anti-nuclear movement that really planted a lot of seeds for the climate movement. Um, okay, so uh, earlier I showed you the repo data um, map. And so these are just a couple screenshots, but I'm gonna show you actually how to get into this. So just a couple screenshots. So I don't know this, there are probably way more archives than this in Los Angeles. So um, this might not be comprehensive and that's okay, but hopefully this is at least many of the archives in LA. Uh, this is um, with one foot of sea level rise. Um, and this also is very interesting. So there's now a wildfire layer that you can use within um, most mapping software. And it kind of tells you, where there's um, reported fires. Most of these that I was looking at yesterday, um, I don't think there's any, the, like the biggest wildfire I could find right now is actually somewhere on the East Coast. I think it's like in North Carolina. So, um, okay, let me, before we go on any further, let me go back and um, we're gonna show you how to use some of the data. Can you guys see right now um, this repo data? Can you see my browser? Okay, super. So um, let me actually put in, there's a short, you, there's a URL shortener for this. So let me put this in the chat. So if anyone wants to follow along with me, here's the map. Um, let me... Sometimes it will change where, okay, good. This is still zooming into LA. Sometimes when I like create those URL shorteners from this map, sometimes it will like lock on to a different area. So I was like, oh no, I'm going to put in like this link and then it's going to lock on to like Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, but anyway, I think this will take you right to LA. Um, so this is, this is the repo data map. So this has... Um, data from across um, the United States. And um, just to show you a few things that you can do with it. And again, feel free. We're like, we're so good on time right now. So let me know if there's anything that's unclear. But you can first start um, by finding where you want to look at. So um, let's say actually, I wanted to look at Houston. So I do have pre populated bookmarks in here. Um, but let's go back to Los Angeles. Okay, so here's Los Angeles. Um, when you get into a certain level, you can also um, click and see where things are. So this is the City of Commerce Public Library. Um, all right. Then what you can do, so there are actually tons of layers on this. They're just all turned off right now. And that's because when I, whenever I go in and edit this map, um, by default, I do not turn on all the layers because if I did, like, first of all, the map would be like so unreadable, um, but also it would just take nine years to load. So when you want to turn on some of these layers, what you do is there's this button in the middle here that says show contents of the map. And here you can choose from a wild variety of different things. Um, you can also, uh, one of the things that we did with the repo data was we uh, tried to put things into categories. So right now, every black dot represents an archive or a place to know, place known to hold archival records. However, if you wanna see things by category, you can turn off the top layer and turn this one on. And now we have color coding. So the way to get to a legend is um, 
if you see here this layer, there's like this first little icon show legend. So now you can see, okay, like here's a whole cluster of college and university libraries over there. I, what, what's the university that's over here? That's UCLA. Okay. All right. I was like, that's really UCLA, isn't it? All right. So, yeah. okay. We'll put back on the... Um, I think we have like five UCLA people here on this on this uh, call. So, yeah. Got it. All right. It's our house. Is is like, we can see our house from here. <laughs> so, um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, there's... Um, uh hurricane layer hurricane and typhoon layer so i think let's just zoom out sometimes you have to zoom out to see things so let's see if there's anything and i think this will show both oceans okay i don't think there's anything out there right now so that's a good thing um let's take a look at some other i just, I just knocked on wood for you yeah <laughs> Let's take a look at some. Okay, so let's go down to the current wildfires, current incidents. So when you get down here, you can click on things and it will tell you usually how many. So, you know, this like 0.01 acres burned. I like, I don't know, is that like a spark kind of caught fire in someone's front yard? You know, probably, probably not anything too big. Um but just to give you a sense, I had mentioned that um, sometimes it will show you the area of a fire. And again, there's not this, when I was looking earlier this week, I couldn't find any any perimeters in California, but I think there was one, let me see. I, I really do think there was one in North. Yeah, here we go. So here's what a perimeter, when there's a fairly large fire going on. So actually this is over in North Carolina. Um, so you can see when there's a, a large established fire, this is what the perimeter looks like within the map. Um, but let's go back to LA here. Um, try to think. So then uh, if you if you really want to give yourself nightmare fuel, you can look at um, sea level rise layers. So these go up to um, certain things. And just to give you, okay, so I'm not going to do six feet because that's 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 a little apocalyptic, but we'll, we'll just look at three feet. Um, what you're seeing here um, is you'll notice here that there's both blue and green. So what that means when you see this in a sea level rise layer is um, green is areas that could flood that are hydrologically unconnected to the ocean. So they might be some kind of low lying area or something like that, but they are not like directly connected by a waterway or some other kind of pathway to the ocean. Um, and then the the darker something is, the deeper it is. So that's why um, when you're looking, that that's sort of the current depth, not necessarily like how much sea level rise there is. So obviously the ocean, you know, off the continental shelf, that's quite deep. But when you're looking at areas here, these are already, you know, there's land there, right? So the depth is much less than once you're out in the actual open ocean. Um, so that's kind of what um, you can see here. You know, this is the difference between one foot of sea level rise and three feet of sea level rise in, in this illustration here. Um, the other thing that I want to showcase that I think is super important, let me go back to all of LA. Uh, is, where did I lose it? Oh, okay. This is actually a great illustration of something. So um, you will notice if you can see here on the left-hand side with all your layers that the flood hazard areas and detailed streams, those got grayed out. So at certain map scales, you are unable to see certain things because usually they have a lot of detail in them. But once you zoom in closer, those layers will be re-enabled for you to select. So we'll scroll back in. Okay, we can't select them yet. Scroll back in. Now they're available. So let's look at flood hazard areas. Um, this is, um, if you've ever heard of a 100 year or 500 year flood, that's kind of what this is talking about. 
And it's worth noting that flood people don't really talk about 100 and 500 year floods anymore. So the terminology is a 1% flood, which would be roughly analogous to a 100 year flood, or an 0.2% flood, which would be roughly analogous to a 500 year flood. But the reason that people are getting away from saying like, X hundred, you know, 100, 500 year floods is now what's happening with the changing climate. We have like 500 year flood events that are now happening like much more often than every 500 years. And so a lot of flood policy experts have said in many ways, this is misleading because it's sort of giving people the sense that, oh, this would only happen, you know, every once in a while and it's becoming more frequent. So this is, um, let's just look at the legend real quick. So if you notice, let's try to zoom in a little bit. Here's a good area of contrast. So um, that darker purple, that's a 1%. So what formerly would have been called a 100-year flood zone. Um, and then the lighter purple is a 0.2% or formerly known as a 500-year flood zone. <clears throat> so this is important. Because in the United States, any of you who have ever lived in a flood prone area probably know that certain areas, depending on how that flood map looks, requires you to buy flood insurance to buy property in that area. Um, so that's why this is relevant. And there is actually um, a few years ago, the Smithsonian issued a policy that said they would no longer build new Smithsonian buildings within one of these floodplains. I forget whether I forget whether it was the 0.2% or, or 1%. It might have been 1%. Um, uh, so I'd have to go back and look at that. But um, it, it is certainly um, something to be aware of. And, and the politics of flood insurance are, are, are very, very, very... Um, political. So that's that's a fascinating thing. If you're ever interested in the politics of maps, flood insurance rate maps are like some of the biggest map fights that are happening in the country, like not just recently, but over the last 30 years. Uh, when I lived in Louisiana, there was um, a lot of pressure from a lot of parishes, which are the counties down there. Uh, there was a lot of pressure um, that the parishes were directing towards FEMA not to update flood risk maps because they didn't want people to start having to pay additional flood insurance rates um, because then that could have caused like a real estate spiral. Uh, but that also meant that uh, people were living in areas of higher flood risk and Right now, you cannot buy flood insurance through the private market like you haven't been able to for like 40 years. So the federal government is the only flood insurer. Um, so if you have flood insurance, you're getting it through a, a federal flood insurance provider. Um, so anyway, I won't go on into flood insurance rate map policies and politics, but it is extremely fascinating if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole. Okay, that's what I kind of wanted to show you with repo data. Let me um, just quickly show, I was talking about CalAdapt. So um, we could talk about, you know, the watersheds you want to look at. So um, is there any particular watershed you got, want me to look up? Can we look at San Francisco in the Bay Area? Sure, just Bay Area. Yeah, we can uh, look at actually, that. Actually, actually, um, down in down, uh, go go south down to like San Mateo and uh, San, like Santa Clara County. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, Palo Alto That's area. Since we're talking about digital stuff, looks like Palo Alto is kind of right on a couple of different watersheds. So let's, interesting. Let's look at this one. I have a friend who's in Sunnyvale, so we'll look at this one. Cool. Um, yeah, so this will tell you um, kind of the temperature potential. Um, this language here, this RCP and whatever, whatever, that's that's uh, language taken from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so um, it's actually slightly outdated language. They, they use different acronyms now, but 
our CPs are sort of like, it's basically like, how many more emissions are we going to do? So mm -hmm. our CP 8.5 is like literally burn all the existing coal within the next few years. It's just like, you know, that's the, that's just the effort. <laughs> that's yeah. That's the, yeah. The effort. Um, like we're, we're all going to die. Let's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's Stop actually you leave a good looking corpse. It, it's more emissions than what we are currently doing. So it is, it is really the, yeah, throwing in the towel one. I, I forget. And again, because the RCP language is, that was sort of the last big intergovernmental panel on climate change. The more recent one, they changed the name to SSPs. Mm -hmm. um, so I forget kind of what, when they were still using RCP language, which trajectory we were on. But basically, this gives you a sense of like, okay, because this is what all climate policy is based on. It's like, if we do X, then Y, right? So if we burn this many more fossil fuels along this emissions pathway, this is what we can expect to happen. So that's that's kind of what you're seeing here. Um, this also will talk about, um, again, they, they have these same kind of emissions pathways here. So um, sort of, uh, this is a thing you'll often see in climate change stuff too. It's like maximum precipitation within a day because that's a signal of um, major rain events, um, which is becoming a problem in, in many parts of the country. And then, of course, of great interest um, to those of you in, in California is wildfire stuff. So um, this is something I haven't looked at much before, but this is really interesting. So this is predicting um, the annual acreage of potential burned areas. So yeah. And again, remember I said baselines are really important in climate change stuff. So this is giving you a baseline based on 1961 to 1990. And, and what was sort of the average then compared with if we are on specific emissions pathways in the future, what could we expect by 2035 to 2064, and then what could we expect beyond that? So I hope, let me, I think I have one more, couple more slides I want to go through before I turn it over to Snowden. Let me pull up this one here. Um, so one of the things that is really interesting that I encourage everyone to do, and I have to take my own advice on this, is to look and see if your jurisdiction, so your city, your county, wherever you are, has some kind of climate action plan. These go by tons of different names. So like climate adaptation plan, sustainability plan, LA County calls theirs the climate vulnerability assessment. But they typically will consist of essentially some kind of recognition of how climate change is going to impact an area and then the policy things that is going to happen. So the city of Cincinnati, where I live, literally just finalized a new climate action plan, like within the last two months. So I, I have to go and read Cincinnati's. But they're really interesting, because they will often give you a sense of how local officials are planning to sort of steer their, um, steer their jurisdiction in terms of um, climate change action. And for those of you who live in um, places where your state government actually cares about this, which California does, I can tell you the state government of Ohio does not. <laughs> so, so our cities in Ohio, we're kind of just doing the best we can because our state government doesn't, doesn't care. But um, a lot of times what you will see with city or county climate action plans that are part of a state where there is concern about climate change, You'll often say you'll often see how they try to align with that larger plan, right? So, for example, I'm I'm doing um, some work right now with with um, an organization in New York, and so I am looking at sort of how some of those local climate change plans also reference some of the mandates that are coming from the state. So that can be really useful to look at, especially for those of you who might be in public libraries or at public universities, because you could, might expect that at some point that might filter down to your organization. So if you see that, um, like, all of it, like, maybe you live in a jurisdiction or, or you work in a jurisdiction um, where they have pledged 
that they're going to like, I- I'm just spinning this out of thin air. This is not actually from the LA County uh, assessment, but maybe they have said that by 2040, uh, they're going to expect like um, all of the buildings within that jurisdiction to uh, be, to, to have additional electrical capacity for electrical vehicles or something like that, right? So then you might want to be sort of prepared to be like, oh, okay, we have a building where right now, like, there's no place next to our building to plug in an electric car. Although given that like electric cars are everywhere in California, maybe this is a bad example to share with y'all. But um, that would be the kind of thing where I'd be looking at that um, in Cincinnati being like, okay, you know, is should I accept at some point that someone larger in my organization might be coming to me and saying, we need to figure out how to, you know, deal with this requirement that is coming from the city or the county or the state. So um, I think this link is in the slide deck, in the source notes and the speaker notes, but um, these are pretty easy to Google. So if you just look up like, um, you know, city name or county name, California climate action plan, you, you usually can find them that way. And I'll also um, drop a link in the chat to something from Georgetown University called the Adaptation Clearinghouse. That is a great resource where they try to track as many of these um, city, county, state climate action plans as they can find. So that's a great resource. Um, Snowden already found it. All right. Well, Snowden, I I don't think we're at Q&A yet because um, you have some stuff that I think you wanted to share. So if you want to go ahead and take over for a few minutes, go for it. First, let me unmute. And if you want to unshare. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. And then I'll share mine. Um, because this is a, um, this is a good moment. Let's see, share screen. There we go. All right. Come on, PowerPoint. Let's do this. Um, so I just want to, um, talk. So let's see, is it in presenter mode yet? What's going on here? Slideshow. Slideshow. Excellent. Okay. You guys can see my, my, like this beautiful. Yep, looks good. Excellent. Awesome. That's what I want. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few sort of California specific resources um, and uh, oh, and thanks for the adaptation clearinghouse link. I was going to find that next. Um, so I just want to um, highlight a few uh, LA specific resources um, and just talk about the context of our um, Southern California collections and how our community-based archives really contribute to both our understanding of climate change um, and our response to climate change. The stories we tell about, ways we advocate with our collections and through our collections that we um, are the stewards of in, in keeping those community-based records. Um, and materials. So um, obviously California um, is the nation's breadbasket. We produce a significant percentage of the produce that um, America eats. We also, um, because of our colleges and universities, we are a source of technological innovation and science, um, climate science research, um, and cultural capital, the art, the expressions, the, um, the ways in which people have responded to climate change um, creatively um, is also represented in archives collections and um, community-based uh, records. So we're a center of immigration. Um, Angel Island um, is the is one of the most um, heavily used um, immigration points in the United States. We have particularly strong um, immigration patterns from South America and the Pacific Rim, which are um, areas of the globe that are going to be um, tremendously impacted by climate change, particularly Pacific Rim countries and the islands of the Pacific, which are, you know, we are, we are the nearest coastline um, to many thousands of people 
Um, we're also a second city to many, many nations. So we have diaspora communities that if you considered the population of X people in Los Angeles, um, we would we that that population would constitute um, a group larger than the population of many of the biggest cities in those countries themselves. So we are um, we are witnesses to and and our our community in Los Angeles, our communities in Los Angeles are repositories, living repositories of cultural memory in the form of foodways and cultural observations, um, the calendars of festivals, the formation of neighborhoods, the founding of, um, of religious institutions, um, the social life and the economies um, that um, diaspora communities create naturally um, by moving in and, and calling a new place home is reflected in our community-based archives. And I think one of the in connection with the topic of climate grief that um, ERA explored, um, I think that archives have an important role to play in this discussion as a place where we can be reminded that there are long-term problems of all kinds, that history is um, is cyclical, um, and, and uh, Stephanie pointed this out as well, that curricula in, um, in classrooms, the topic of um, climate change, ecology, and conservation um, has come and gone, and we've made progress each time. We can see what worked and what didn't. So archives are a way that um, we can reflect on um, the history of a movement um, or the history of um, our efforts to make progress. And we can see that um, incremental progress is still progress and that we have come some distance. Um, I think it, it can change how we respond to the challenges of the moment um, by looking at the challenges of the past and how we may have risen to them, um, failed or learned lessons in that process. So we also keep records that help tell the story of climate change. I think that it's important for each of us to reflect on specifically what materials in our collections um, when we're working with an archive um, might contribute to what we know or could know about climate change. They certainly reflect the different ways in which we have talked about it. Um, you know, looking back at a newspaper collection um, or newspaper repositories from the 1980s, we used the phrase global warming and our language around climate change and, um, and extreme weather versus global warming um, is, is uh, something that has altered. So the where the rubber meets the road um, between archives and climate change, climate change, I think, is digital humanities. So we get involved in digital humanities projects or our, our collections are used um, for digital humanities. And that's one of the ways in which climate related collections can be highlighted or shared with a broader audience or made more more relatable and accessible. Um, it's also important for us to be thinking now about what collections and records might be in demand in the near future. Um, we, we've certainly seen a lot of um, thinking about how to serve that demand um, through digitization on demand during the COVID era, as we discussed earlier. Um, but there, there's a, there are chances all the time for us to get out in front of things and identify collections that um, that if we if we build it, they will come. If we make the data available or if we pro put invest time in um, in uh, in foregrounding those collections, maybe in a blog post or social media, um, maybe in a workshop or exhibition that we might create demand for or raise audience awareness of uh, materials that are relevant and, um, and that speak to these issues. And of course, the communities that are represented in our collections. What are the distinctive ways in which climate change affects communities? And that might be something as, um, as, as, as um, small as certain ingredients that people need for um, traditional observances, um, flowers that don't bloom anymore during the season when the festival is traditionally observed, or spices that are increasingly expensive and hard to get and have been replaced in recipes um, because out, out of necessity. Um, I was just reading um, about the, the shortage of gum Arabic from that is a result of the um, of the conflict in Sudan. Sudan is one of the only places in the world where gum Arabic is 
is um, harvested. It's a natural product. It's a, um, a tree sap and it is um, an essential product. So this ties into what we were talking about earlier about supply chain issues. Um, so the distinctive ways in which um, climate change affects communities um, is worth, worth thinking about and keeping an eye out for and speaking to, um, communicating that, highlighting that, that, you know, this is, this is a traditional observance. Um, you know, it, it's if there are often many communities observe um, holidays or um, cultural festivities after a specific um, time in the season, when when something goes into bloom, when um, you know the first rainfall after the first full moon of summer, um, there are weather related um, cultural observances as well that are community based and that can be affected by climate change. So. Um, these these can be really emotional and granular and um, and part of the storytelling around climate change in a, in a really compelling way that charts and graphs sometimes don't reach people. Um, and charts and graphs can also be um, misleading um, or or overwhelming or people just kind of tune them out. But people often respond really well to a photograph or to a story. So other types of records um, that I think are worth uh, thinking about, just sort of brainstorming, because again, you know, it, um, as, as Stephanie's um, chat post pointed out, you know, looking at curriculum records and seeing that climate change is reflected in those, um, that would never have occurred to me. But yeah, um, just thinking and, and talking about the records that, um, that we know um, reflect climate change. So newspapers, newsletters, and local history. If something is, if weather is weird enough to make the um, the senior citizens community center newsletter or the front page of the local newspaper, um, then that is remarkable weather. Um, it, and if it compares favorably or unfavorably to the weather we have now, um, that's something that uh, that can be a data point. Um, and actual science and data collections, whether they're atmospheric science, aerospace, agriculture. Um, I just started going through the alphabet and realized that the science and data collections are everywhere um, and are often part of archive materials um, or personal materials of scientists um, who may not have published that data, but may have collected it. Local government records, um, population numbers, policies and budgets. Um, budgets are, um, are political documents. They are a statement of values. So when you start to see in, um, in city budget planning, people talking about disaster um, or disaster management, or um, or climate mitigation um, funding when that starts popping up in the minutes of city council meetings. And of course, vital records, um, the things that people need to demonstrate that they exist in society um, when society becomes chaotic, up upended, or, um, or, uh, or seriously affected by climate. And then of course, um, again, communities of affinity, culture, and nat national origin, um, the waves of migration and the rise of or the birth of a community or the extinction of a community in any particular geographic location can be driven by world events, including climate events. And last but not least, maps. Any map you have can be a map that relates to climate. Um, because as as um, Era mentioned at the very beginning, we're all connected. Like our water, our watersheds are connected. We are connected individually and um, locally and globally. Um, and the way we express those connections is by drawing boundaries and lines on paper that represent where we are and um, and and who we are and where we live. So I just want to highlight some, oh, I forgot to put the link there. I just want to highlight some local examples um, that you may or may not be aware of that I think um, are really interesting places to see the history of climate um, play, played out on a local level in different ways. Um, so the uh, California Water Documents digital collection um, it, it, of the Claremont College's library is an amazing set of materials um, that includes um, uh, not just official documents of the water district, the Metropolitan Water Districts, um, but also ephemera and um, and political advocacy materials around the use of water in Southern California. So um, it is it is a fascinating collection. It is it's rich and it um, it talks about how we've 
it, it speaks to how we've talked about water in a place, in a part of the world, which will be very, very deeply affected by the availability of fresh, clean water. Um, and, and, you know, it, that is a, a, a current and pressing concern. The NASA JPL, um, they have an amazing archives. If you are a current student, um, know that they have internships there often, which are paid. Um, and they also do space data. You, we are able to see what is happening um, in climate change because of our space program and because of our ability to do imaging on a global level. So the space um, exploration, um, outer space is how we get our best look at uh, our planet. And, um, and you know, from a, a bird's eye view of our little blue marble. So those are um, those are things you might not think about rocket science having anything to do with climate science, but it certainly does. And the LAPL photo collections. I just did a quick um, search in their collections for um, snowfall. The word snowfall. What 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 comes up? And um, and we see in 1949 there was snow in um, Coldwater Canyon and in Pasadena, and there are pictures of it. So we can have climate science and um, climate impacts and extraordinary weather events made visible. Um, so if you're looking for things to illustrate a discussion about. Um, our expectations for place and climate. Um, this is these are great collections to dive into um, and talk about again newsworthy weather um, at a time when we we are always looking at the headlines for the latest superstorm. And that brings me to the amazing Archives at Risk Help Desk. I want to make sure that we highlight the resources that are um, particularly useful for um, archives that are dealing with climate, um, climate issues and, and managing and adapting to the changes of our climate. So that can be, um, find, you can find resources related to that in collection management, conservation and preservation, and disaster response. Um, I wanna highlight just a few things that relate specifically to wildfires since one of the people who registered for this um, unit did want specifically to know about wildfire um, uh, recovery efforts. Um, so I'm just using that, like, we obviously have earthquakes and floods and, um, and major storms as well, but um, let's talk about fire because we're in fire season. Um, the, there's a FEMA leaflet um, that is a two pager. If you are um, in an area that is prone to um, wildfires and you want to have something on hand to refer people to, um, if people are contacting your archive and saying, you know, our, our family's um, heirlooms and photographs were damaged in the fire, what do I do? This is a fantastic, very accessible um, resource that can be shared. It's written for the general public, um, but it includes a ton of resources that are very useful for an archivist that might be dealing with um, fire, smoke, or water damage um, from a, a, a wildfire affecting their institution. Likewise, the AIC and FAIC, the American Institute of Conservation, um, has a soot and ash segment um, that is very, it's quite technical, but it's about mitigating soot and ash damage um, to uh, heritage materials, um, mostly paper-based materials and photographs, um, but it looks, it talks about safety procedures and keeping yourselves safe. Um, as well as um, mitigating the damage from soot and ash, which, which is not just dirty, but chemically reactive um, and can cause problems uh, if it is left to sit on um, heritage materials. The California Preservation Program provides disaster recovery assistance, um, and there's a link on, uh, on the, on the um, the help desk resources for directly to that disaster recovery assistance program. There's a hotline you can call and they also provide funding. Um, and there are also links in the disaster recovery area to creating a disaster plan, just templates for basic, basic creating, creating a disaster plan. If your organization does not have one, it's worth just downloading the template and looking at it and asking yourself the basic questions of what are we at risk from? What, uh, what collections and items are of highest priority or most vulnerable? And what basic phone trees can we put into place? What resources might we need to increase our chances of 
um, of having uh, minimal damage or um, rescuing the things that are truly unique, priceless, and um, and that we that we value in addition to the lives and safety of our staff and our, our community members. There's a National Discovery Fund for Archives that was started in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina, um, which I think was a real um, uh, a real tipping point um, for realizing the the propensity for disaster to affect um, heritage institutions um, and to to cause damage that would need to be mitigated sooner rather than later. Um, somebody mentioned the mud angels of the Florence flood. Um, I think Katrina was our Florence flood. And we've um, hope, hopefully stepped up as a community um, to respond to that. And last but not least, I want to draw some attention to um, another project of the funders of this workshop series, the California State Library, um, created in 2021, a series of information sheets um, that summarize the value of California's public libraries. And while it's focused on libraries, it's very um, broadly applicable to, um, to public institutions um, more, more generally, including um, archives and um, museums. Museums. Um, and I've specifically linked to the crisis response and community resilience fact sheet, which, um, which uses a case study related to California wildfires, um, but also um, functions like in public libraries, serving as a cooling center um, for people who may not have access to air conditioning during the day, and the, the specific nature of libraries as a trusted place that people are more likely to go to um, when they are at risk than other institutions. So thinking about the role that archives play in communities that are undergoing serious challenges or have just experienced a disaster, um, people uh, look to preserve their histories and, and the archives and libraries are places where people make phone calls, look for information um, and non-book resources, um, including a place to recover and rebuild. And let's see, I think this is my last slide. I also want to invite everyone who's participating or viewing this recording online um, to help us make that help desk better, help us help you. If you don't see resources on the help desk that you need or want, if you have questions that aren't answered there, um, or if there are services, tools, and information that you've used as a library or archive um, and have found useful and want to share with others or want to help reach the broader audience of your archive colleagues, um, please feel free to let us know. There's contact information on the website, lassubject.org. Um, there's an archives at risk committee um, link from the main page. And you can also email the chair of the committee, Mallory Fernier, directly um, at mallory.fernier at csun.edu. And, um, and I also am um, a resource to you. If I can be of assistance or if you have suggestions um, for us, we would love to hear from you. Um, it's a community-based and community-serving resource, and um, it can also be community-contributed. And this is a great moment to um, move into discussions. Snowden, um, <clears throat> let me throw a link in here that I discovered recently. And I'm curious, it's, um, let me see the name. It's uh, see the Sustainable California Libraries. I'm wondering if you know of anyone who has gotten this. I, I, my reading of this oh, is that it's very it much. This is the first time hearing of it. Yeah, I just discovered this a week or two ago. So my sense is that um, it might be targeted towards mostly public libraries. Although looking at the eligibility criteria, I think it could apply to a number of libraries. So um, yeah, just throwing it in there. That's amazing. Thank you. We'll make yeah. sure we do that. Um, I, I am not familiar with this program, but it's really good to know that that's, um, again, as we were saying, like the policies and um, and budgets um, that that are, yeah, so this is 2023 to 2027. So um, it's nice that they put a minimum of $10,000. That's tremendous. Um, programming educational opportunities focus on sustainability and climate resilience. That sounds amazing. 
Um, and another another really um, excellent resource more broadly for libraries is um, Let's Move in Libraries, which does public programming that um, often includes things like um, nature walks or um, or book walks um, that gets get people outside and paying attention to their local community. I mean, I, I am delighted by the fact that my local branch of LAPL um has cork oaks in the um in the planted in the parking lot there's a stand of cork oaks and um that is a you know cork is another um uh uh you know natural product that is being um being affected by climate change and the um and pests and infestation um that affect oak, the oak tree family um and and bark the bark eating insects. Um, so cork harvests have been um, up and down as the climate changes. And, and, um, and, and you know, I, every, I always think of that when I go to the public library um, because of the trees they have planted outside. Any thoughts from Stephanie or Rick? Would love to hear from you if there are things that you need to know as students that, um, that or Rick, um, specifically as students or working archivists in this community, we'd love to hear from you. You don't have to, of course, but we'd love to if you do. Uh, just wanted to share my general appreciation on the, on the presentation. I'm still learning. This was a really great introduction to what's important, what, 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 what's being engaged with. And yeah, no, this was just a really wonderful resource for this. So I, I really appreciate uh, both, both of your uh, insights on this. So thank you. Yeah, uh, it was, this was terrific, Era. I was so glad to be able to hear all of this. It's so informative. You're very welcome. Maybe I'll put up, um, I don't want to cut off the discussion too early, but let me put up, um, if you don't mind, actually, wait, I wasn't ready. Um, I just wanted to put up my contact information so that people have it. So let me grab that last slide and just share it again. Okay, so hopefully um, you all can see this. Um, th did it come up, Snowden? Okay, cool. So um, yeah, just uh, I, I'm a very, um, as anyone who can tell you who's <laughs> dealt with me, I'm a very easy to get in touch with person. Um, so the main way um, is through email, but I'm also, I have a few social media handles. Um, and I'll just say um, that I have recently made a pretty significant career change. So I um, had been at the University of Cincinnati, but I just started my own um, uh, consulting and freelance archives um, business, basically because I am trying to uh, do as much climate change and cultural heritage work as possible. So uh, if that's ever anything that anyone on the call or anyone watching this wants to work with me on, um, my business is called Memory Rising, so you can get in touch with me and uh, I'd be glad to talk more. So that's kind of my brief uh, yeah. And I, brief I moment love, of self promotion. I would love it. I, there's nothing wrong with that, and I will. Um, I will mention as well on the Archives at Risk help desk. Um, the Archives at Risk um, committee has a sort of self help program for archives, um, a sort of a mentorship program. Um, but I would love um, to, to and and not just you, but any consultants. What kinds of things do consultants work on archives with? I think many people. I, I I'm coming. Uh, out of a period of consulting and freelancing myself. And I think that it's been, it was always surprising when people said, like asked like, oh, what, you know, what do you do? Like an archival consultant, like what do archives need consultants for? Um, so talk a little bit about the kinds of services or work that you, um, you have done or that other consultants in the field do with archives. How, how do you help with those areas of greatest need? Uh, thanks. I, I promise that Snowden and I did not rehearse this beforehand. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not in the game anymore. Uh, but, but I do think it's, I think, um, knowing what services are out there is sometimes yeah. just, you, sure. you don't even realize you need it until you somebody points out like, oh, yeah, you can you can pay somebody to do that for you. Um, you may not have the capacity in-house, but you, you can just spend a few thousand dollars and actually get that done. So I would imagine writing disaster management plans is one thing, but what else? Right. Yeah. So I think um, my 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 really big skill sets that I, I bring just I'm just talking for myself is um, through research and also um, 
I, I had a really strong background in records management and appraisal when I worked at the University of Cincinnati. So um, just to give folks a sense of kind of some of the work I'm doing right now, I'm um, there's a, a library organization that I'm working with that has um, a number of member libraries and they're they're just sort of trying to figure out like what are their larger institutions doing around climate change and how might the member libraries be a part of that um, change? So that's a very like high level kind of looking at a lot of climate action plans of across these different institutions and figuring out where the libraries might fit in. So that's that's the type of work I'm doing right now. Um, there's also, um, uh, you know, my my strengths again are that I used to do records management for about 10 years. And so um, one thing I would love is for an environmental organization to reach out to me and help them develop a records retention schedule. Um, and I've also um, uh, been in touch with folks about from other universities where they are engaging potential donors who are related to environmental and climate movements, and they need someone to do a collection assessment of that donor's potential collections, and but they don't have the subject matter expertise about climate change or environmental movement work to really um, do kind of the type of appraisal that that um, content that deserves to figure out if their library is the best destination for it. So that's, um you know, these are all kind of things that I'm actually working with or conversations that I'm kind of part of. Um, so again, yeah, I'm, I just want to keep working on environmental work as much as possible. And, and um, people hire consultants and, and freelance archivists for all sorts of things. So um, there are people who will like, process, you know, a collection that you don't have time <laughs> to do, they will, they will do that. There are a lot of freelance archivists that will work for private clients. So, you know, families or small institutions that can't afford to hire their own archivist will, will hire a freelance archivist. So that's, you know, what people do. Very cool. Thank you. And, um, and can people reach out to you with questions about I have a thing, like, do I need it? Can I get a consultant for that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're almost at time and I've covered all my content. Um, Stella, do you have anything to add? I also do want to mention that um, the LA as subject um, June 13th um, general member meeting, um, which is open to all, will include a brainstorming session in the afternoon. Um, for anybody who would like to um, discuss the series, workshop series that we've had, um, we're going to invite um, folks to participate and zoom in. And Era will be potentially making a little victory lap, um, a, a little, a little return hello. Um, so if you, um, we'll we'll be sending uh, announcements out to everybody who registered for this as well. But um, just want to put in a plug for that and continued involvement with LA as subject is always welcome from anybody who here now. Well, on behalf of the LA is Subject Archives at Risk Committee, um, I want to thank everybody for coming, for um, giving the time, and for helping us spread the word about these resources. We really appreciate it. <laughs>